Representation Theory of Finite Groups, Lecture 5, Tensor Product. Let us start by briefly recalling the content of the previous lectures. For a finite group G, we consider the category G mode of all finite dimensional G modules over the field C of complex numbers. A G module V is called simple, provided that it is non-zero, and the only submodules of V are the zero submodule and V itself. A G module V is called semi-simple, provided that it is a direct sum of simple modules. We have seen the following important statement, which is called Schur's lemma. Part 1. Every non-zero homomorphism between simple G modules is an isomorphism. Part 2. The only endomorphisms of a simple G module are the scalar multiples of the identity. And we have also seen the following statement, which is called Mushka's theorem. Every finite dimensional G module is semi-simple. Mushka's theorem allows us to write every G module V as a direct sum of simple modules. We can further collect together the isomorphic summons and write V as a direct sum of the form L1 to the power direct sum K1 plus L2 repeated K2 times plus and so on plus Lm repeated Km times where Li's are pairwise non-isomorphic simple modules. The number Ki is called the multiplicity of Li in V and is independent of the decomposition. It can alternatively be determined at the dimension of the homomorphism space from V to Li or from Li to V. Now let us recall the notion of tensor product of vector spaces. Let V and W be vector spaces. Consider the vector space curly V with formal basis consisting of all possible elements of the form V tensor W, where V is an element in V and W is an element in W. Let curly W be the subspace of V generated by the following elements. So the first set of elements look as follows. So we take V plus V prime and then tensor it with W, and then we subtract V tensor W and V prime tensor W for all V V prime in V and W in W. The second set of elements looks as follows. We take lambda V and tensor with W and we subtract lambda times V tensor W for all complex numbers lambda, for all V in V and for all W in W. And similarly for the right argument, we have elements of the form V tensor W plus W prime minus V tensor W minus V tensor W prime and V tensor lambda W minus lambda times V tensor W. Definition, the quotient space V modulo W is called the tensor product of V and W. And the usual notation for this is V tensor product over C with W. We know the following fact. If V1, V2, and so on Vm is a basis in V, and W1, W2, and so on Wk is a basis in W, then Vi tensor Wj, where I ranges from 1 to n, and J from 1 to k, is a basis of the tensor product V tensor over C W. In particular, the dimension of the tensor product is equal to the product of the dimensions of the factors. So now let us start with two G modules. So they are in particular vector spaces, so we can consider the tensor product as vector spaces. And the claim is that there is a natural G module structure on this tensor product. Namely, it is the G module structure, which is given as follows. So if we take an element G in G and the element V tensor W, then V 
define G applied to V tensor W as G of V tensor G of W for any G in G, V in V, and W in W. Let us start with the observation. The formula for the action of G obviously defines a unique linear transformation of the vector space Carly V, which is used to define the tensor product of V and W. And this is because the elements of the form V tensor W form a basis of V. If you want to define a linear operator, it is enough to specify what this linear operator will do to the basis elements. So this defines for any G in G, a unique linear transformation of the curly V. Claim this defines on the curly V, the structure of a G module. So to prove this, we take two arbitrary elements G and H in G and try to see what happens if we apply the element GH from G to the element V tensor W from curly V. So by definition, the outcome will be the element GH applied to V tensor GH applied to W. Now, using the axioms of the action, GH applied to V is equal to G applied to H of V, and similarly for W. So now we have this element G on the left in both factors, so we can take it out using the definition of the action of G. So G of H of V tensor G of H of W is equal to G applied to H of V tensor H of W. And now we can apply the definition to the argument h of v tensor h of w to get g of h of v tensor w. So the element gh acts in the same way as the composition of first h and then g. This proves our claim. Now let us prove the proposition. So recall that the proposition says that this defines on the tensor product the structure of the G module. The tensor product is a quotient of curly V by curly W. And we have just established that curly V is a G module. So to prove proposition, we need to prove that the curly W is a G submodule of V. And for this, we of course need to check that all elements which generate curly W are sent to curly W under the action of G on curly V. So let's take the type one elements and compute. So the type one element is an element of the form V plus V prime tensor W minus V tensor W minus V prime tensor W. If we apply to this element an element G in G, then using the linearity and the definition that G, when it acts on x tensor y, it acts on x and on y at the same time. So we get the element g of v plus v prime tensor g of w minus g of v tensor g of w minus g of v prime tensor g of w. And using the action axioms, in particular the action of g on v is a linear action, so we can rewrite g of v plus v prime as g of v plus g of v prime. And then we have the element, which is obviously a type one element generating w. So if we apply g to a type one element generating curly w, we get a type one element in curly w. So let's take the type two element. So this is an element of the form lambda v tensor w minus lambda times v tensor w. And let's apply G to it. Again, using the linearity of the action of G and the definition, this is equal to G of lambda V tensor G of W minus lambda GV tensor GW. So since the action of G is linear, G of lambda V is equal to lambda times G of V. And then the element which we obtain is manifestly the type two element which generates curly W. So applying G to a type two element generating curly W, we end up again with a type two element, 
in curly W. And similarly, one can check for the elements of type three and four. This establishes that curly W is a G submodule of curly V, and therefore we have the induced action of G on the quotient curly V modulo curly W, which is the tensor product of V and W by definition. Let us now look at some basic properties of the tensor product. For any G modules V and W, we have the tensor product V tensor with W, and this is a G module. So this tensor product V tensor W is called the tensor product of the G modules V and W. The first basic property, the tensor product of V and W, is isomorphic to the tensor product of W and V, via the isomorphism which sends V tensor W to W tensor V. In other words, tensor product of G modules is commutative. Basic property two, if additionally we have a third G module U, then the tensor product of V with the tensor product of W and U is isomorphic to the tensor product of the tensor product of V and W with U. And this isomorphism is given by sending V tensor W tensor U to V tensor W tensor U. In other words, tensor product of G modules is associative. Basic property three, if U is a G module, then V tensor product with a direct sum W plus U is isomorphic to the direct sum of V tensor product with W and V tensor product with U. The isomorphism is given by sending V tensor product with W plus U, such an element, to the element V tensor W plus V tensor U. So this means that the tensor product and the direct sum of G modules, they are connected by the distributivity law. And finally, basic property number four, let C denote the trivial G module. Then the tensor product of C with any G module V is isomorphic to V by sending one tensor V to V. So one is a basis element of C. So in other words, the trivial G module acts at the identity with respect to the tensor product. And of course, in all four cases, the isomorphisms which are given here are the usual isomorphisms for vector spaces. So the point is that they are compatible with the G module structure. So here is an easy example. Consider the cyclic group of order two, Z2. This is a group of residue classes modulo two. And let V be the regular G module. So the identity element acts on any representation as the identity matrix. And the standard basis of the regular representation consists of the elements of the group, which means zero and one. And the matrix of the action of the element one on this regular representation is the matrix zero, one, one, zero. So this is because one plus zero is one and one plus one is zero. So now let us look at the tensor product of this left regular representation with itself. So it has the obvious basis consisting of 0 tensor 0, 0 tensor 1, 1 tensor 0, and 1 tensor 1. And the matrix of the action of the element 1 in this basis on the tensor product is as follows. So this is the matrix which has everywhere zero apart from the opposite diagonal and on the opposite diagonal we'll have ones. So how can we compute this? So if we act by one on zero tensor zero, we should act by one on both zero on the left and the zero on the right. So we will get one tensor one. This is the last element. So the first column of the matrix is zero, 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 one. So if we act by one on zero tensor one, so we have to add one to zero, we get one, and we have to add one to one, we get zero. So we get one tensor zero. 
This is the third basis vector, so we have 0, 0, 1, 0. And similarly, the third basis vector goes to the second basis vector, so we get 0, 1, 0, 0. And the last basis vector goes to the first basis vector, 1, 0, 0, 0. So this is a computation of how a fixed element of the group acts in the natural basis of the tensor product, if we know the action in the original module. Let us now do a more complicated example. Let V be the natural representation of S3. The exercise which we will do now is let us explicitly decompose the tensor product of V with itself into a direct sum of simple submodules. The standard basis of the natural module of S3 is given by the elements 1, 2, and 3. S3 acts naturally on the set, and therefore the elements of the set form a natural basis of this module. So recall that we already know that the natural representation of S3 decomposes as a direct sum of two simple submodules, U and W, where U is a linear span of the element little u given by 1 plus 2 plus 3. So this is a one-dimensional trivial submodule in V. And W is a two-dimensional simple module given by the linear span of the elements W1, which is 1 minus 2, and W2, which is 1 minus 3. So using this fact and the distributivity of tensor product and addition, we can compute that V tensor V is isomorphic to U plus W, tensor U plus W. And using the distributivity, this is a direct sum of U tensor over CU, U tensor over CW, W tensor over CU, and W tensor over CW. Recall one of the basic properties, if you tensor with a trivial module, then nothing happens. And we know here that U is a trivial module. So using this, we see that if we take M1, the submodule given by the tensor product of U and U, it will be isomorphic to U. This is a trivial summon of V tensor V with a basis U tensor U. So we can take M2 as a tensor product of U and W. So this is isomorphic to W. This is a simple submodule with basis U tensor W1 and U tensor W2. And finally, we have M3, the simple submodule given by W tensor U. So it's isomorphic to W. It's a simple submodule. And it has the basis given by W1 tensor U and W2 tensor U. So this describes three out of four summons in this decomposition. What remains is to decompose the tensor product of W with itself. So it remains to decompose W tensor W. So this module has the following basis. W1 tensor W1, we denote it by A11. W1 tensor W2, notation A12. W2 tensor W1, notation A21 and W2 tensor W2, notation A22. And the group S3 consists of six elements, E, S, T, ST, TS, and W0, which is equal to STS or TST. So here S is a transposition of 1 and 2, and T is a transposition of 2 and 3. And then we can compute the matrices of the action of the transposition 1, 2, and 2, 3 in the basis A11, A12, A21, and A22 of the tensor product W with itself. And we will have the following matrices. So the matrix of S is 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And the matrix of T is the matrix 0001, 0010, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So this can be obtained by direct computation using the definition. So in order to be able to decompose the tensor product of W with itself, we need to understand eigenvectors for these matrices.
the usual procedure how you determine eigenvectors for the matrices gives us the following results. So the matrix S, so it has on the diagonal 1, minus 1, minus 1, and 1, and it's an upper triangular matrix. So it has eigenvalue 1 with multiplicity 2 and eigenvalue minus 1 also with multiplicity 2. The linearly independent eigenvectors for eigenvalue 1 are 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0, minus 1, minus 1, 2. So if you multiply 1, 0, 0, 0, you get 1, 0, 0, 0. Or 0, minus 1, minus 1, 2. So here it gives us 0. 1, minus 2 gives us minus 1. 1, minus 2, minus 1. And here we get 2. So these are indeed two linearly independent eigenvectors for the matrix of S with eigenvalue 1. And similarly, we have two linearly independent eigenvectors for the matrix of S with eigenvalue minus 1, which are 0, 1, minus 1, 0, and 1, minus 1, minus 1, 0. So for the matrix of T, we have also two eigenvectors with eigenvalue 1, namely 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1, 0 and two linearly independent eigenvectors with eigenvalue minus 1, namely 1, 0, 0, minus 1, and 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And then we can immediately see that we have a common eigenvector for both matrices with eigenvalue 1, namely the eigenvector 2, minus 1, minus 1, 2. We just add these two guys, and here we add 2 this, minus 1 this. So 2 minus 1 minus 1, 2 is a common eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. And similarly, 0, 1 minus 1, 0, it appears in both lists, is a common eigenvector with eigenvalues minus 1. So it follows that we have the submodule M4, which is one-dimensional because it's generated by a common eigenvector. And this submodule is just a linear span of the element 2a11 minus a12 minus a21 plus 2a22. So this is a trivial summand. And we also have this summand which is isomorphic to the sine module, m5, and this is just a linear span of the vector a12 minus a21. Only two dimensions are left, so let us determine what happens with them. So consider the inner product on v tensor v, for which the elements of the form I tensor J form an orthonormal basis. It is very easy to see that this inner product is G invariant. One can compute the gram matrix of this inner product restricted to the subspace W tensor W. And then this gram matrix in the basis A11, A12, A21, A22 is as follows. So it's a matrix 4, 2, 2, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 2, 2, 4. So having this matrix, we can compute the orthogonal complement to the eigenvector 2, minus 1, minus 1, 2. So this is the one which generates a trivial submodule inside all S eigenvectors with eigenvalue 1. And we will see that it is spent by the element minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. 2. So let's denote it by B1. If we now define B2 as the image of B1 under the matrix T, then B2 is equal to 2 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. So let M6 denote the subspace generated by B1 and B2. So since T square is equal to 1, of course if we apply T to B2 we get B1 back. And then we can compute that the matrix S sends B2 to the vector minus 1, 2, 2, minus 1, which is equal to minus B1 minus B2. That is, it's an element in M6. So therefore, M6 is a submodule. And it is a simple submodule because T and S don't have common eigenvectors in that submodule. It has dimension 2, any proper submodule would need to have dimension 1.
but there are no common eigenvectors, so no submodules of dimension one, which means that M6 is simple. So finally, we can write that the tensor product V with itself decomposes as a direct sum of submodules M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, and M6. So here M1 and M4 are trivial modules, M5 is a sign module, and M2, M3, and M6 are simple two-dimensional submodules. Let us now talk about Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Let G be a finite group, and L1 and 2 and so on Lm, a complete and irredundant list of simple G modules. Let us denote by gamma ijk the multiplicity of the simple module Lk in the G module Li tensor over C with Lj. So this number gamma ijk is called the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. So here are some basic properties of these coefficients. If Li is a trivial module, then gamma ijk is equal to the Kronecker delta jk. So this follows directly from the properties that tensoring with a trivial module does nothing. Li tensor Lj is isomorphic to Lj. Basic property two, Gamma ijk is equal to gamma jik. So this follows from the fact that tensor product of G modules is commutative. And basic property three, we have the following identity. The sum over all s from one to m, m is a number of simple modules. Gamma isr, gamma jks, is equal to the sum over all t from one to m, gamma ijt, gamma tkr. This follows from the property that the tensor product is associative. Both sides of this formula compute the multiplicity of the simple module Lr in the tensor product of Li, Lj, and Lk. Here is an easy example. Consider again our group with two elements, Z2. Then the regular module over this group has two submodules. The trivial submodule U, which is a linear span of the sum of basis elements, and the sine submodule V, which is a linear span of the difference of basis elements. We know that tensoring the trivial module U with any module X gives X. We claim that tensoring V with itself gives U. To prove the claim, we just need to compute the action of the element one in our group on the tensor product of V and V, where little v is this our standard basis of the module V. By definition, one applied to V tensor V is one applied to V tensor one applied to V. One applied to V is minus V, V is a sign module. So this gives us minus V tensor minus V. And now we should take minus from both sides, which gives us minus one squared, which is one. So the outcome is V tensor V. So capital V tensor capital V has a basis on which the element one acts trivially. So this is a trivial module and hence it's isomorphic to you. So here we have the tables of the tensor products and of the corresponding Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. So tensor in U and U gives U, U and V gives V, V and U gives V, and tensor in V and V gives U. So the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients gamma blank blank U gives us the summons U in this table. So it's one, zero, zero, one. And the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients gamma blank blank V give us multiplicities of V in this table. So it's zero, one, one, zero. So before we move forward, let us now talk about tensoring of one-dimensional modules. Let V be a one-dimensional G module with basis V. Then every element G in G acts on this basis element V via some scalar. Let's call it lambda G. Let W be another one-dimensional G module, now with basis W, 
and assume that an element g in g acts on this basis element via some scalar mu g. Then little v tensor little w is a basis of the g module capital V tensor capital W. And an element g in g acts on this basis in the following way. So g applied to v tensor w by definition is g of v tensor g of w. So g of v is lambda g of v and g of w is mu g of w. So we should move out lambda g from the first factor and mu g from the second factor. So we get lambda g times mu g applied to v tensor w. This is how g acts on the tensor product of one dimensional modules. Note that since g is a finite group, each element in g has finite order. Actually, each element in g to the power the cardinality of g is one. So this implies that if we take lambda g and we take the power of lambda g given by the cardinality of g, we must get one. But in particular, it follows that the absolute value of lambda g is one. Also, since g and g inverse are inverses to each other, it follows that lambda g is equal to lambda inverse of g inverse. Consequently, lambda g is equal to lambda of g inverse, complex conjugated, because if you have a complex number of absolute value 1, then its inverse is given by complex conjugation. Lemma, let v be a one-dimensional g module with basis v, on which each g in g acts via lambda g, a complex number. Then the vector space v tilde with basis little v tilde, on which each element g in g acts via the scalar lambda g complex conjugated, is also a g module. To prove this, consider two elements g and h in the group g. And let us compute. So the complex conjugate of lambda g h by module axioms is equal to the complex conjugate of lambda g times lambda h. So this is because lambda g h is equal to lambda g lambda h. Since the complex conjugation is multiplicative, the latter is equal to the complex conjugate of lambda g times the complex conjugate of lambda h, which means exactly that v tilde with the action of g defined via the complex conjugation of the action of g on v is a g module. Corollary, the tensor product of v and v tilde is a trivial g module. So this follows from the previous page, since lambda g times lambda g complex conjugate is equal to 1. For any one-dimensional module v, we have explicitly constructed a one-dimensional module v tilde, such that their product is a trivial g module. Corollary, let v and w be g modules, such that w is simple and v is one-dimensional. Then the tensor product of v and w is a simple g module. Proof. Assume that the tensor product of v and w decomposes as a direct sum of u1 and u2. Then, let us start with w. Of course, w is isomorphic to the tensor product of w with a trivial g module. But we have just seen that the trivial g module is a tensor product of v and v tilde. So we can write w as a tensor product of w, v, and v tilde. So now we decompose v tensor w, and so we get that this big tensor product is isomorphic to v tilde tensor u1 plus u2. Using the distributivity, we get that this is isomorphic to v tilde tensor u1 plus v tilde tensor u2. But w was assumed to be a simple module, so one of these summons must be zero. And if v tilde tensor u1 is zero, so we know that v tilde is one dimensional. So this means that the dimension of u1 should be zero, which means that u1 should be zero. Or if the second summand is zero, then this means that u2 should be zero, which proves 
our corollary. So let us now address the classification of all simple S3 modules. So we consider our symmetric group S3 with six elements, E, S, T, S, T, T, S, and W0. S is a transposition of one and two, T is a transposition of two and three. So we know the following simple S3 modules. We have the trivial module, it has dimension one, all elements act as the identity. We have the sign module, it has dimension one, and all elements act as their sign. So the elements S, T, and W0 act by minus one, while the elements E, S, T, and T, S, they act as one. And then we have the two-dimensional module W, on which S acts via the matrix minus one, minus one, zero, one, and T acts as a matrix zero, one, one, zero. And we know that simple modules appear in the regular module with multiplicity given by that dimension. So if you consider U plus V plus W with multiplicity 2, the total dimension will be 1 plus 1 plus 4, which is 6, which means that the left regular module is isomorphic to U plus V plus W with multiplicity 2. And in particular, it follows that U, V, and W is a complete and irredundant list of simple S3 modules. Let us now describe tensor product of S3 modules. So we claim that we have the following table of tensor products of simple S3 modules. So this is a tensor product, U, V, and W. So when we tensor with U, U is a trivial module, tensoring anything with U gives us our starting module back. So U tensor U gives U, tensoring V gives V here, and tensoring with W gives W. So V is a sign module, so the same computation as for Z2 just tells us that V tensor V gives U. So this is a sign module, tensoring the sign module with itself gives us a trivial module. Furthermore, we know that tensoring the one-dimensional module V with a two-dimensional simple module W produces a simple two-dimensional module. But such module is unique, so it must be W. And finally, the decomposition of the tensor product of W with itself, we have computed earlier in the lecture. So it is given by U plus V plus W. So this is the table which describes tensor products of simple S3 modules. So we can now use this table to produce the tables of Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. So we collect this into three tables for Klebsch-Gordon coefficients for each of the resulting simple modules. So the co Klebsch-Gordon coefficients for the multiplicities of U and V are as follows. The multiplicity of U is given just by the identity matrix. So if you look at this tensor product matrix, U appears on the diagonal with multiplicity one. So V appears here and here. So the multiplicity of V is given by the matrix 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And finally, W appears once in the last row and in the last column. So the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient for the multiplicity of W in the tensor product is given by the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So let us now define the notion of a representation ring. Let G be a finite group and L1 and 2L so on Lm a complete and irredundant list of representatives of simple G modules. Consider the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients gamma i, j, k for G. Definition, the representation ring R of G, which one can also denote by Rc of G to specify that we work over the complex numbers. So this representation ring is a free abelian group with basis L1, L2, and so on, Lm, and the multiplication which is given in this basis by the following formula. If you want to multiply Li with Lj, we get the sum of Lks with coefficients given by the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Remark, 
the associativity of this multiplication follows from the associativity of the tensor product of G modules. The distributivity follows from the distributivity of this tensor product. The representation ring is commutative due to commutativity of the tensor product. And the representation ring is unital due to the basic property four. The unit of the representation ring is Li, which corresponds to the trivial G module capital L, I. Here are some easy examples. If G consists of only one element, then it has only one simple module, which is trivial. And so the representation ring of G is just the ring of integers. Example two, if G is the group with two elements, the group Z2, then it has two simple modules, the trivial module and the sign module. And we know that the sign module tensor with itself gives us a trivial module. So by definition, R of G has a basis consisting of the elements LU and LV. So LU is the identity element because U is a trivial module and LV times LV is equal to LU because V tensor V is isomorphic to U. Consequently, the representation ring is isomorphic to the integral group algebra of G by sending the element LV to the group element one in our group Z2. Some general notation, the trivial G module is usually denoted by C triv and the sine G module, whenever it exists, is usually denoted by C sine. And let us finish with some description of endofunctors coming from the existence of tensor product of G modules. Any M in G mode defines an endofunctor from G mode to G mode given by tensoring with M. So this functor has the following properties. It is exact for any M, and this is because a tensor product over a field is always exact. Tensoring with a trivial module is isomorphic to the identity functor on G mode via the isomorphism which sends V tensor M to M for any M in G mode and where V is a fixed basis element of the trivial module. Finally, if M is one dimensional, then tensoring with M is an equivalence and the inverse of this equivalence is tensoring with the module M tilde. This is because the tensor product of M and M tilde is isomorphic to the trivial module and tensoring with the trivial module is isomorphic to the identity factor. So in particular, it follows that the category G mod acts on itself functorially by exact functors. Here are some problems and questions. Question one, prove that for any triple UV and W of G modules, the G module W, direct sum with U and then tensored with V, is isomorphic to the direct sum of W tensored with V and U tensored with V. Question two, compute all klebsch gordon coefficients for Z3. Question three, compute of klebsch gordon coefficients for the dihedral group D2 times four. Question four, compute the representation ring of D2 times four explicitly. And finally, question five, prove that for a commutative group G, there exists a ring isomorphism between the representation ring of G and the integral group algebra of G. Thank you very much and see you next time.